You've probably seen them, you've definitely heard them. Jet engines, from fighter jets to airliners and even the Batmobile, they power the modern world. But most people don't know how they work and have no clue where they came from. Today, we are going to change that. Believe it or not, jets are older than Jesus. The first jet engine type concept was actually invented in ancient Greece in about 150 BC. It's called the Aeola pile, like a spinning tea kettle basically, and this could have been used to power ships or, or move water for a modern plumbing system or even create the first car, but because it was ancient Greece, they, they didn't do anything with it. Thanks, Greece. With the end of ancient Greece, jet engines were mostly forgotten. That was until 1867 when a Russian attempted to patent and build the first jet engine. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Using Newton's third law that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, you could actually force a gas out the back of a vehicle and push it forward. So what he came up with was that you could take air in into an item known as the intake, you could burn it in a or combust it in a section known as the burner or combustor and you could shoot it out the back in what is known as the exhaust or I guess the, the back of the engine. You could exhaust it out. He designed what was known as the ramjet. What he actually built was a was a pulse jet, but you don't need to know about those because they're dumb and they suck. But the problem with the with the ramjet is that you had to be going some speed for it to work. Air had to be entering the engine for it to continuously burn. Otherwise, it would just burn out and not work. So that meant that they didn't really work on the ground. And until things started moving fast enough, it was impossible to build a jet engine that worked. And with that, the idea kind of died out because it was it was the you know the middle of the 1860s, and you know, people did not have supersonic fighter jets, partially because jet engines didn't exist. But that changed in the late 1920s when Frank Whittle, an officer in the RAF, came up with the idea that, once again, without any knowledge that some Russian guy had ever done it, that you could take air in, burn it, and exhaust it. But he also came to the same conclusion. It wouldn't work unless there was some sort of element to bring the air in when whatever vehicle was not moving fast enough. He separated the intake, the burner, and the exhaust, and he added what is known as the compressor and turbine. Now, we'll talk about what those are later. A lot of people consider Frank Whittle to be the grandfather of jet aerospace, but he really isn't because his jet engine didn't work. By the time he was building his prototypes, it was the 1930s, and other countries were also trying to develop their own jet engines. The United States, Britain, and unbeknownst to them, Germany. In Germany, a young college student named Hans Joachim Popst von Ohain, or Hans von Ohain for short, quite a genius, he decided that he would also without any knowledge that Whittle had already done this, separate the intake, the combustor, and the exhaust with a compressor and a turbine. The difference between Ohane and Whittle is that uh, Ohane's engine used a, a different method to compress the air, and his actually worked before Whittle's ever did, so he did build the first functioning jet engine. By 1940, Germany had a functioning jet engine, and that jet engine went over to Messerschmitt, where it was redesigned and improved a little with a few modifications made, and actually a, a lot of modifications, and turned into the Jumo 004. Jumo 004 was the first production jet engine, and it had a lifespan of a, about 10 to 25 hours of flight time because the metals that were in them were not very good and the, the turbine sections, you know, the part after the burner, tended to rip apart, so it, it didn't really work. But how did they accomplish this? What, what made this all work? Well, let's start back in the 1860s. Intake, burn, exhaust. That is a ramjet. But for many aircraft, that didn't work, as previously mentioned. So we had to come up with solutions that would allow airplanes to run their jet engines on the ground. As mentioned, we went to a five-stage system. Intake, compression, combustion, turbine, and exhaust. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow, push the button, and away we go. But what does all that mean? Well, it means in the intake, there is an inlet that allows air to enter the engine efficiently. But before it reaches the burner section, it has to be put into a state where it's ready to be burned. It has to be compressed. And this is where Von Ohain was able to get ahead of Whittle. You see, he came up with an idea that we could shove the air in and we could spread it out to the sides using what's known as a centrifugal compressor. A centrifugal compressor is a spinning disc with veins on it. And what happens is the air reaches the spinning compressor and it sends the air outward into pipes that send it off 
to be burnt. And in the process of doing this, the air gets a lot denser, the pressure increases, and it's ready to be burnt with a lot of fuel. But by the time the first production jet engine uh, occurred, the Jumo 004, they'd gone with a, another method, which is actually more common to a lot of the airliners and fighter jets you see today, the axial flow compressor. Think of the axial flow compressor as essentially a, a Pringles can with a lot of fans shoved inside of it. And each fan causes the air to get a little more compressed, squeezed together. By the way, every two fans is called a stage, but to help make it more efficient, there's also fins on the outside in the, of the shell in there. For technical terms, we call these rotors and stators. The spinning blades are called rotors because they, they rotate, and the stators, as you could probably guess, are called stators because they, you know, they, they, well, well, they, well, they don't rotate. They, yeah, what, what, what do they do? Oh, they stay. Once it comes out of the compressor, these different stages, the air is nice and compressed with a high pressure. But the idea of a jet engine is for it to be blown out the back as high velocity. So what we do is we light it on fire. We, we put a fuel in there. In the beginning, it could have been hydrogen or alcohol, but the mainstay jet fuel is uh, kerosene, basically what you put in a diesel truck. This kerosene is injected into the engine and lit on fire. And as the, as the fire happens, there is an expansion. Remember, as things get hotter, they expand. And when they expand, it needs to go somewhere. This is kind of like how a bullet works. When you shoot a bullet, the expanding gases push it forward. A jet engine works the same way. The gases expand, they have to go somewhere, so they go out the back of the jet engine. So the compressed air is ignited, and then it has to move very quickly, creating a high velocity thrust. And this thrust is what pushes the jet forward and pushes the aircraft it's attached to as well. But what comes next? What, what, what is a turbine? Well, think about it like this. We have to power that compressor somehow. So what are we going to do? Are we going to power it with an electric motor or are we going to do some sort of hydraulic system? No, no, no. We do something far simpler. We're actually going to take some of the energy that we just extracted from that kerosene and, and ignited the fire and created the high velocity. We're going to use it to spin a turbine. So the turbine is essentially just another compressor, but it works in reverse. The high velocity gases spin the blades, spin the rotors in the turbine, and that rotation turns the crankshaft, which in turn turns the compressor and keeps the engine running. In fact, about 80% of the power produced by a jet engine goes right into running this turbine and keeping the compressor running. So it's a, it's a constant cycle. 80% of the energy goes right back into keeping the engine running. The turbine is extremely important and a very critical part of the engine because the now burnt gases are extremely hot and moving very, very fast. This first rotor in the turbine, these first set of blades, they are the hottest part of the engine. And this is what caused those Jumo 004s to fail early on. This is why jet engines are expensive. The metals that go into this section have to be very precise and very, very heat tolerant. Now, once it's moved through the turbine and it's gone through the rotors and stators, that velocity is ready to be used, and that is where the exhaust comes in. The exhaust is very good at improving the thrust. In fact, a poor exhaust on an aircraft can uh, quite literally cause it to barely run at all. In some cases, especially in the military, the exhaust can include what's known as an afterburner. That basically just means that we're just dumping more fuel into it and lighting it, hoping to get as much power as we can. It's not very efficient, so you wouldn't see it on an airliner. What I've just explained to you is the function of a turbojet. These were the first jet engines in the 1940s and 50s. Since then, we've come up with multiple different types. So you have the ramjet, the pulse jet, the turbojet, the turbofan, and the turboprop or turboshaft. That brings us to the turbofan. You'll see a lot of turbofans nowadays. The turbofan is almost identical to the turbojet with one major change. The turbofan adds, and, and this will surprise you, a fan. This was actually the most difficult part of, of school for me, was learning this. The fan in a turbofan can sometimes be mounted to the compressor or mounted to the turbine, but the general idea is that it works like a propeller. The difference between a propeller-driven aircraft and a jet-driven aircraft is that the propeller moves a lot of air at a low velocity, so high volume, low velocity. A jet engine uses low volume, high velocity. And some genius inventors decided we can do something in between. The fan in a turbofan is great because it makes the whole system a lot more efficient. While the jet's running and, and keeping itself running, 
The fan on the outside can actually generate a lot more thrust than what we can on, on the inside. In fact, in a turbofan, it can make anywhere from 50 to 90% of the total thrust of the engine. That fan makes a huge difference. That's why today we use almost entirely turbofans. There are actually three different types of turbofan. There's low bypass, medium bypass, and high bypass. There's also ultra high bypass and unducted, but we will talk about those at a later date. They deserve their own video. A low bypass engine will most likely be seen in a military application. The faster something goes, the uh, less wide it can be. This is because as things move faster, the blades have to spin faster, and as the blades spin faster at higher revolutions per minute, or RPMs, you might reach a point where the tips of the blades can exceed the speed of sound. And the reason this matters is because if the blade of that fan exceeds the speed of sound, it'll create a shockwave and it'll rip the engine apart. We have to keep that bypass smaller so it stays below supersonic speeds. This is why military jets use low bypass engines and sometimes they can use medium bypass engines. And medium bypass engines, it just grows to a little bit larger. A turbofan engine can have a fan diameter that is 30 times the size of that little turbojet on the inside. And that is going to be your engine that produces 90% of the thrust. So that's a turbofan. That's what you'll see in your, in your fighter jets and your airliners. That's the jet engine as we know it. But there's also another type of jet engine, a turboprop or turbo shaft. This is essentially a turbojet engine that is used for a, a not, you know, fire out the back application. Maybe it's staying on the ground and, and powering a generator. Maybe it's powering a vehicle like a Batmobile. Or it's being used to fly a helicopter or turn a propeller, which is useful in some low speed applications. That's where the turboprop comes from. Essentially, it's just a turbojet engine with a gearbox attached to it, what's known as a gear reduction drive. This takes the crazy 10,000 plus RPM in the jet engine and brings it down to a usable speed. Now, there are two different types of turboprops, but we're gonna do our own video on them. Just understand that there is uh, exhaust driven and mechanically driven. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If it isn't, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it at a later date. So at this point, now, you understand jet engines, which hopefully it wasn't that bad and hopefully you enjoyed this. So now, when you're riding on an airliner or staring at a fighter jet in a museum or even looking at the world's only turbine-powered Batmobile, you can explain what's under the hood and how it works. Thank you so much for your time. I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you liked it, please give us a subscribe and if you didn't like it, well, be sure to tell us why in the comments and, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll... Maybe I'll respond.